If you know anything about me, you know that I love music. It's a passion of mine and largely the reason I am where I am today. So it might be a surprise to you to find out that I didn't grow up around much music. My parents didn't have a lot of interest in it. My father was deaf. Uh, I suppose the correct term here would be is deaf, but he's since had a cochlear implant. So I guess I, I view it a little bit differently now. And my mother, if memories are correct, always had more interest in news radio, WBZ News Radio in Boston to be exact. Now, there were times when we had music on in the car. I've got memories of hearing Stevie Wonders. I just called to say I love you while driving to the doctor's office as a kid. And there's the Everly Brothers. Ah, yes, the classics. Primarily the song All I Have to Do is Dream. We used to have a three-hour drive to go visit my grandmother. And there was this oldie station along the way that used to come on the radio. And that, for whatever reason, is the one song that I remember hearing all the time. And my dad here was kind of interesting. Even though he couldn't hear the music, he had a fondness for it. He's got a hell of a record collection that's been collecting dust at the house. There's an original copy of Michael Jackson's Thriller in there that I've already called dibs on. My dad, even though he couldn't hear the music, he could feel it. So he was attracted to music with really strong beats or good bass lines. So rock music of the 70s was a big thing for him. Bands like Black Sabbath, Chicago was one of his favorites too. Anything that had like big percussion sections to it were things that he liked. In his truck, he had two cassette tapes that were always there. So we're talking about the 80s here. Naturally, one of them was the Miami Vice soundtrack. And yes, if you're scratching your head, uh, there was a soundtrack to a TV show, and it included arguably the best drum solo ever. I still have not mastered the air drums for that yet, and it's not for lack of trying. I have tried to play the air drum solo for that uh, thousands of times at this point. The other tape he had was the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. Very interesting combination of music here, but I do still get a little giddy when I hear the song Hungry Eyes. For me, I was pretty out of it when it came to knowing about popular music. Sure, I knew who new kids on the block were. I saw Joey at a Red Sox game once, actually. This was back in their heyday. Actually, my dad is the one that saw him, and my dad pointed him out. I was like, why, why do you know? who Joey is. I should be the one getting excited. But I digress. I knew the massive names and the songs, but that's where my musical knowledge ended. I mean, if it wasn't the number one song on Casey Kasem's Top 40, I probably didn't know about it. When I got a little older and was able to access more opportunities to hear music, I started eating it up. I was insatiable. I just loved it. There was nothing that could stop me, I mean, other than class and going to sleep, I suppose. Like most people, my beginnings fell more in the pop world. It's just easier to get access to the biggest songs on the planet. Uh, thinking back to that time, it was Vanilla Ice, uh, CNC Music Factory. Oh, oh remember, remember Snow? I loved that album. It was called 12 Inches of Snow, which as an adult, I feel like could have had a sexual meaning. I don't know if that's true, and I don't want to know. Honestly, let's just leave it at that. But there was some good stuff on that album, too. I really like the song Lady with the Red Dress. I have a vivid memory of begging my mom almost to the point of a temper tantrum uh, to let me buy this cassette tape. Yes, this was the time of the cassette tapes. We were standing outside Sam Goody at our local mall, and I was just begging for this tape. Now, eventually I did get it, and I still have it, actually. My parents just dropped off a big bin of all my cassette tapes that were at their house, so I've got it sitting here in this room that I'm recording this podcast in. Anyway, back on topic. As I started to figure out more about what I liked about music, I found that I was attracted more to rock music. In the mid-'90s, alternative rock was becoming a thing. MTV was filled with music videos for from Weezer, Tool, Dave Matthews Band, Green Day, Offspring, Jeff Buckley, and so many more. It was just this constant wave of new, amazing music. My local rock radio stations were WBCN and WAAF. Now, WBCN was more of the alternative side of things, while WAAF was the rockier and heavier side. One thing, though, they both had in common was Alice in Chains. That band quickly became a favorite of mine. I don't know if I can pinpoint the song or the moment. I was a little late to the party. By the time I got into Alice in Chains, they had already released Jar of Flies, but I do remember being drawn in by the song Man in the Box. There was just something about the chunky guitars and, of course, that voice of Lane Staley. Do you remember uh, field days at school? Did you have these? 
These were the days where you didn't have classes and instead you spent a day or two outside with your classmates competing in a variety of activities. It's kind of happened in like elementary and middle school. They range from normal events like the 100-yard dash to things like an egg toss. And of course, the tug of war was the biggest event. Tug of war was like the Super Bowl of field day. And as a heavier kid growing up, I often ended up in the anchor position, which I will still maintain to this day is the most important position in the uh, tug of war battle. During our field days, we'd have a teacher that would play music over the loudspeakers of the outdoor stadium, and, and kids would request songs. Mostly, it ended up being current hits, well, the ones that were deemed appropriate, of course, and classics like The Day the Music Died, which if I never hear again in my life, it will still be too soon. God, I hate that song so much. I remember being in eighth grade, walking up to the tower with my friend Matt to request a song of our own. He had the Alice in Chains CD for facelift. Now, somehow we convinced the teacher to play Man in the Box. He specifically asked us if there were any language issues on the song. And I said no, because, hey, I'd heard the song on the radio, so it must be fine, right? That was the day I learned a very important lesson about radio edits. Yeah, (laughs) I had no idea. At that time, that there were uh, curses in the song. Uh, The teacher was not very happy with us, and he killed the song after about 30 seconds. But we still felt accomplished that we got Alice in Chains over the speakers at field day in eighth grade. And as much as Man in the Box was a big song for me, it wasn't the song that really hooked me and turned me into a massive Alice in Chains song. That honor belongs to them bones. I feel so alone. guitars it's the guttural noises from lane and just the overall driving force of this song them bones is one of those songs that i wish was 10 minutes long but it clocks in only at two minutes and 30 seconds and that's pretty short for a rock song in that era actually this is the time where rock songs were getting kind of epic and in fact the whole album that we're going to be talking about today most songs are like about five minutes or more long except for Them Bones sitting there at 2.30. I still remember the first time that I heard Them Bones. I was driving in my friend's car when it came on. I was sitting in the back. I literally jumped through the two front seats to turn it up. I could not believe what my ears were hearing. And this was a time before Shazam, right? Like before streaming. So I heard the song and anxiously waited for the DJ to tell me who it was. Much to my dismay, they did not. That was the worst, right? That was the worst feeling. You relied on the DJs back then to tell you who the songs were by. When they didn't tell you, you were lost. Now that I've been a professional radio DJ for over 20 years, I will defend this person by saying that the song was not new at the time. Like I said earlier, I came to the party of Alice in Chains a little bit late, so I'll give them a pass for not telling me what song it was because I probably should have known what it was already. It was Zem Bones, though, that brought me into the album Dirt, which is my A album for Visor Library. Alice in Chains, legendary Dirt, spent years in my car Visor organizer. To explain how much I love this record, I first had a copied version that a friend made for me. I took his CD and copied it from his CD to a cassette tape for me. And then I went out and bought the actual tape copy because I didn't have a CD player. And when I finally bought a CD player, I almost immediately purchased Dirt on CD as well. So I had three different copies of Dirt floating around my house and car for about a decade. Uh, Since this is the first episode of Adult Education Advisor Library, here's my vision for the show. I'm going to give you some backstory into my life, talk about what was going on around the time that I have memories of uh, falling in love with an album, and then we'll dive into the record. I'll take you track by track to describe my favorites, and I'd love to hear from you after you listen. So please feel free to join the conversation via social media. I'm not a great writer. Uh, Creative writing was never my strength, so we'll see how this goes. I'm probably going to use a lot of the same adjectives over and over, like awesome. (laughs) That's a favorite of mine. Please don't judge me too hard when I say awesome for the 47th time in a podcast. So Dirt starts off with Them Bones. I just talked about this song a little bit. Just a really fantastic record. And when I first dove into the album and I heard that song, it was a cool moment for me because I didn't know that was the song that I had heard in the car. As I mentioned, I heard it there. But all I was able to figure out was that the band was Alice in Chains. My friend made me a copy of his CD. When I put it in, I was so, so happy to hear the song that I was looking for right there at the start. And I I still jam out to Them Bones now. In fact, I put it on my running mixes. I think it's like the perfect running mix song. After Them Bones, you get Damn That River. And as the kids would say, that's another banger. Uh, it's the chorus for me on this one. Lane Staley brings his voice lower for more of a growl in this one than a yell like we're used to. And it's just a game changer. I'm surprised he doesn't do it more on other songs, actually. It really adds depth to what he can do. 
Raymond I Die is kind of interesting for me. I think it's a great song, but I need to get through the first minute or so. No disrespect, but that musical intro part, just not my style. Uh, the next song is Down in a Hole, and this is a sleeper hit for me. I know it was a single back when the album came out, but I don't think it gets the attention that other songs did. It wasn't as big of a mainstream hit. Phenomenal song, though, one that should be listened to if you aren't super familiar with it. I wanted to go back and listen to Dirt before I put this podcast together because it's been a while since I sat down and listened straight through. Sick Man was not one of my favorite songs on the album at first, but listening back again now, it's great. It's a little more chaotic than other songs on Dirt, which is probably why I didn't like it 20 years ago when I was listening to it, but definitely some cool stuff. I like how they try some new things and push the envelope a little bit. The next track is Rooster, and I think that's arguably become the most famous song on the album. I think it's kind of a toss-up between Rooster and Wood. Rooster is still getting a lot of solid rock radio airplay these days, so I think that one came out on top, and rightfully so. I mean, it's a nearly perfect song. The slower parts, the louder parts, the story, it's just a masterpiece in contemporary rock music, but especially from the grunge genre around that time. There weren't a lot of other bands that were doing songs like this back in 1992 when this album came out. Not everybody agrees with me on this one, but Dirt took grunge to a new level, by the way. It came out almost exactly one year after Nirvana's Nevermind changed the landscape of rock. And I feel like Dirt took everything to the next step here. All right, back to the track list here. Junkhead was another one that I wasn't in love with when I was younger, but now as an adult, I do have a new appreciation for it. So one that I have to go back and listen to again because I really dig that one. The title track of Dirt is a favorite of mine. The harmonies here between Lane Staley and Jerry Cantrell are almost unmatched in music. I don't think Cantrell gets as much respect as he deserves for what he brought to the table vocally. I think he gets a lot of respect for the songwriting and his guitar abilities, but I don't think people really give him the respect he needs for those harmonies with Lane. Those two, their voices back to back. I mean, nobody else was doing something like that in grunge or in rock music back then. If I had to pick a least favorite song on the album, it would probably be Godsmack. I know fans have loved this one, but it was never really my jam. I think it's lyrically powerful, and it paints a really great picture of addiction and struggles with addiction, but musically, just not really my jam. Which actually brings me to a point that I probably should let you in on. I've always been more of a music guy. Lyrics to me came second. The harmonies, the song structures, they were more important to me than what the singer was saying. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized how dark and depressing this album really is. I probably should have figured that out sooner, to be honest. Songs like Down in a Hole, Sick Man, Junkhead, Godsmack, Angry Chair. I wouldn't say the band was trying to hide their subject matter. They were pretty much slapping us in the face with it. Dirt is almost an ode to heroin and drug addiction. Not only does it praise the feelings that one can have by using drugs, but it also talks about the darkness that can come from it. The lyrics become even more real when you factor in that Lane Staley eventually did die from a drug overdose and the band themselves they were all struggling with different forms of addiction the band was writing and singing about the things that were very real in their lives that's what drew me to them more than other grunge acts at the time i mean how should i word this even though there's a darkness that follows alice in chains i always appreciated their authenticity and i kind of liked the darkness it was real i didn't have drug battles in fact i've never had a drug in my entire life but i could feel the pain through these songs and it really brought me in as a fan Iron Gland is the next song on the list. This is just a short interlude and a playoff of Black Sabbath's Iron Man. So one we can kind of uh, skip over here. The next song is Hate to Feel. That messes with traditional song structure. There's some cool back and forth moments where the song takes you in different directions that you weren't expecting. Also, another opportunity for Jerry Cantrell to stretch his vocal abilities along with Staley's. Jerry's got a much more prominent role on this song, and I dig that. Before we close out the album, we have Angry Chair. and This is another dark horse song on Dirt. Not one that gets a lot of attention, but one that should. For me, whenever I would get to this point in the album, I'd be mentally getting ready for the last track, which is just phenomenal. Uh, But Angry Chair is like the perfect segue into it. And that final track, the album closes with an incredible piece of work called Wood. I think it's the bass line on this one that makes it stand apart from the others. The first verse just draws you in and that chorus punches you right in the face. You don't even see it coming. It's just like a haymaker right across your face. I could listen to this song over and over and over again and never get sick of it. 
Alice in Chains, unfortunately, were done before I was really old enough to get out to a concert. My parents were pretty protective about that stuff. They put out their last album with their original lineup in 1995. I was a freshman in high school when it came out. So, yeah, not really old enough to go on my own to go see an Alice in Chains show. Lane Staley would ultimately die from a drug overdose in 2002 before the band would reunite. That story is sad, but made even more depressing when you find out that he was dead in his apartment for nearly two weeks before anybody even found him. That just breaks my heart. The band would eventually get back together after finding a new singer to take over for Staley. And while no one could ever replace him as the front man, William Duvall does a damn good job, in my opinion. I was lucky enough to see the reunited band play a show at the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. I think it was 2009. It's just a truly magical experience for me, something that I never thought I'd be able to do. And to see them play at that venue made it even more special. The 930 Club is legendary. Some of the best shows I've ever seen in my life have been there. The sound quality is there. The griminess of the sort of old school club is there. If you ever find yourself in Washington, D.C., I would say try to go check out a show at the 930 Club. Honestly, Dirt is a perfect album. I don't think there's a reason to skip any songs while you're listening through It's been a while since I listened to the whole thing, as I mentioned before, but I made sure to do it while putting this podcast together. Just a real treat to go back through all this music. It brought back some great memories of high school and driving around with friends. I remembered all the times that we would try to sing along, but it would just come out as a nasally insult to Staley and his beautiful gift. I've been thinking a lot about my favorite albums while planning out this podcast series, and I I genuinely believe this. I don't think there's any other record in this list that you'll hear over the coming weeks that starts and finishes with a better combo than dirt. I mean, how can you argue with an album that starts like this? Ah! 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 And ends with this. 